Okay, fun story. This is a... I went to my local game store. I, I haven't been out of the house in a long time. I've been to conventions and stuff like that. I guess you could call that out of the house, but out of the house, enjoying myself, not working. You know, I've, I've been out with Scarlet a bunch of times, and but I'm saying what I'm saying is I went to my game store. I've, I've actually not been to the game store in about a year and a half. And um, after going, there's probably a very good reason why I stopped going to the game store. It's because I got a real problem. <laughs> You have no idea how much money I dropped at the uh, at the local game store, which actually, when you when you take my normal purchases over the course of a year, when I did go regularly, uh, probably was less than what I spent at the game store. But I got a lot of D and D stuff because I'm really liking the essentials line as usual. And oh, big news! If you know how I was complaining about the uh, the D and D Insider online. Uh, character generation tools. I complained that the you know the Dark Sun stuff wasn't on there and the um, the essential stuff wasn't on there. They, they, they've been really bad about updating it. Apparently, I got an email. Pardon me, where they're um, they're basically discontinuing the character builder as we know it, but they're relaunching a new version based on Microsoft Silverlight on their website, which will apparently be an updated version with all the current stuff. I'll believe it when I see it. Because, well, they've promised this kind of stuff before, but hey, better late than never, I guess. But the first thing that I got was the Dungeons and Dragons Essentials Heroes of the Forgotten Kingdoms book, which is different from the other one in that I'm, I'm actually a little puzzled by the composition of this book because it's like a, like, this is a player's handbook and, hang on. The one I showed you is a player's handbook, like the one I, the, you know, the, the one that had the fighter, the mage, the thief, the cleric. You know, this is this is basically the core player's handbook, and it's got it's got character generation rules. It's got uh, descriptions of like the basics, you know, melee attacks, hit points, healing, attack rolls, damage rolls, combat. The you know introduction to the game, what the game is like, definition of terms. It's basically a player's handbook, you know. So you've got this. Like, all right, all right. And you've got this, which is basically a player's handbook, but with four different core... It's actually more than four, but, you know, four general character classes. Uh, Druids, Paladins, Rangers, and Warlocks. And each one of those has, like, two to four different options. So it's, like, you know, different builds of, of clerics, you know, different builds of Druids and, and Warlocks and stuff like that. But it does the same thing, it just has different classes. And I, I have to wonder if this is a little redundant. It, it is redundant, you know. Uh, you've got it, it, this this entire first quarter of the uh, up to page eighty one is all that is the same stuff that's in that book. And then you've got at the end, you've got I guess maybe some of the feats are different, but you know the skill chapter redundant. The feats more than a little redundant. The equipment table all redundant so really you're if you've got the last book you're paying for this and i guess i don't know i i don't think you just play DD with druid paladins rangers and warlocks maybe and again it's it's especially redundant when you've got the rules compendium the the other book for the essential sign it just seems like kind of a lot of duplication of effort and i'm not sure why uh, if they just released a class book, you know, this thick, I, maybe they think, like, a thinner book isn't going to sell, or it should be... I, maybe it... I have to think the reason for that is accessibility. Like, if you pick this up, like, if you want to play D&D, &D, you pick this up, and this is all you need to play. Or if you want to play a cleric, you pick that book up, and that's all you need to play. I guess. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. I... I I wonder what the philosophy behind that one was. It doesn't matter to me. I guess it doesn't matter because I can just skip ahead, but... Mm, I don't know. As for this book, um, I haven't read this as closely as I did the others, but there are some new things in it. Uh, it has... The, the new races are... There's the Drow Elf, which seemed a strange... Yeah, um... Actually, a lot of these are new. 
Dragonborn Drow, Half Elf, Half Orc, Tifling. So they're all new. Pretty much all new. And the human, of course. Um, I haven't read to see if they differ all that much from the 4th edition. I don't think they did. And again, this goes back to... The Warlock is really a Hexblade, which is... If there's any class I think was really unnecessary, it was the Hexblade. Because that, that, that was one of those classes, even when 4th edition, when the Hexblade came out, I was like, okay, now we're starting to get like this too many classes rut you know we've, we've got we start doing like the sword mage and the hex blade what's the, <clears throat> what's the difference i don't know sorry my throat's getting dry um the these classes look fine i gotta tell you um the only one i really looked at was the ranger which again is a very back to basics type of ranger uh they have a few nature powers. It's really, you know, um, they, they introduce two. They say, like, okay, um, okay, now I can't remember what the difference between the druid and the ranger was. One of them gets pets, basically. Let me see. Basically, the, the two rangers are the archery ranger and the two weapon ranger. And let me see. Okay, it's druids get pets. Yeah, druids get pets. Uh, the way they define the druids, and again, this is a little ass backwards if you ask me. They they do this thing where they kind of half define the each of the classes. So like they say, okay, here's the thing with the druids and essentials. Now, they dedicate themselves to one of the seasons, and so here's two of them because most druids go spring and summer because those are like the good guy. The good guy druids tend to go spring and summer. You know the, the fall and winter are kind of like life in decline and so most druids don't do that and I'm like alright 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 but why can't we see well I tell you why we can't see them winter and uh, fall it's because there's limited space in the book which again raises the question why you duplicated these you know duplicated the, the main combat rules when you could actually spend use this extra space and kind of define the the winter and the winter and fall druids instead of just just two or paladins they say okay Paladins can they dedicate themselves to a virtue, and here's two of them. They do sacrifice and valor, and yet there's a lot of other virtues they could choose from. And you know, I guess you could you could list a hundred virtues, but two seems limited. And so that's kind of the way it is with almost all the essentials classes. They list uh, clerics. They go okay, clerics. They go there's clerics of the sun and something else, sun and like just goodness or something, you know, and sun and storm. Sun and the Storm. So they choose kind of two domains, and then they very are very limited. And it reminds me of AD&D when they basically release a cleric handbook, one that's devoted exclusively to clerics, and they go, go okay, um, here's like everything clerics can devote themselves to, and they list basically everything. They list spell lists. And so maybe it's a limitation of the way they've designed the classes where... Every time you design a new class, you have to de you have to design essentially every pa you have to design a a new unique list of powers from levels one to thirty for every single class, and that's a design nightmare. You know, so you, I mean, besides that, you actually have to choose you have to design all the unique powers from one to ten, and then you have to design several possible ways they could go from eleven to twenty, and several possible ways they could go from twenty-one to thirty. Because you, when you reach level ten, you choose uh, a paragon path, and there's lots of different paths from which to choose. And then you choose an epic destiny, and there's a lot of other from those which to choose. So, I know, I, I, I actually, I do know why they didn't do this. Like, if they said, okay, well, if we did all four seasons, we'd have to do lists of paragon paths, epic destinies, and powers. For all four seasons. Fuck that. I get that. Mm, I, I don't know what to tell you. So that's it's, it's a little problematic. And really, this is just a book with new classes. And they're good classes. You know, Paladins. Uh, oh, and this is another thing. Um, for the first time in the Essentials line, there is a class with alignment restrictions. Which I think is... Uh, I, I hate to spur on the alignment argument, but it's going to start them again. Uh, if you're a paladin of the sacrifice virtue, you have to be lawful good. And I'm one of the only guys alive who likes the alignment system. And will I, I don't argue about alignments anymore. 
I, in fact, when I start a game and if I'm if I'm enforcing alignments, I just tell you when I'm when I'm doing alignments, like okay, when this is lawful, good. And if, if I I, I kind of especially with clerics and paladins who are very very uh, strictly defined by their alignments, I actually will pull I pull clerics and paladins aside and I tell them basically what's expected of them and the penalties for for not abiding by the general code of conduct just to get any kind of ambiguities out of the way you know and and they if they disagree with me I'll say then don't play this class cuz you're not going to last and so that's it's me being authoritarian it's me being fascist as a dm but it's good to get that out of the way right away so when the paladin stabs a prisoner in the face and he goes well i i go that's not very lawful good and you go like well bahamut wouldn't suffer the evil to live and i'm like it's it's stuff like it it really is stuff like that the prisoner dilemma is a big one you know uh how how a lawful good you know and you can easily you can easily interpret you know here i go arguing alignment again you can easily interpret uh the brutality of a lawful good character you know the the code of honor of a lawful good character because it does take a lot of forms you can and, and i really hate when people argue whether or not there is such a thing as absolute evil you know uh, should i kill the orc babies because they're evil and then like well they're not evil they have you know uh, trust me i've been through every permutation of the fucking alignment argument possible and part of the problem is that the dm really should know better than to put them in situations where you kind of raise that issue because it really is it just causes arguments <laughs> you know um but that's why i talk with it I, I talk it over but yeah this is this is the first time where there's a class with alignment restrictions which i like Although I do wish, I, I really wish they'd bring back just all the alignments. I don't know what they do: lawful, good, good, neutral, evil, and chaotic evil. They don't do lawful, neutral. They don't do they don't do like the different shades of law and chaos. They just have like six, five. They have five. But I got other stuff too. The other thing I got, and again, this is where I start showing myself to be a real book whore. I got the Dungeon Masters token set, and. Really, all this this only has any use if you're playing uh, around a table, because it's basically cardboard tokens. Hang on, wrap the shit out of this. It's cardboard tokens, and what you'll notice when you start playing this game a lot and you start to get higher level is that monsters will throw status effects around like their candy, and it actually is kind of hard for to, for you to mark them. And so I actually mentioned before that... How is this sealed in there? Come out. I mentioned before that I made little cards of status effects. Like if they're dazed, I actually have a little st sign that comes down and says, Oh, you're dazed. Here's what the status effect means. Um, this actually does something similar. Where it... Fuck me. There we go. Tight fit. It's got this little wooden box with Dungeons and Dragons on it. Upside down. <laughs> and what it's got, I might just show you the box itself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this, this one's not as interesting. I'll probably just show you the box. It's got this little bag of counters in it, and it's got little subdivisions for trays. And really, this is just kind of a cool trade for gaming in general. Um, before I, I'll, I'll argue price point in a second, but uh, if, if you've got a little party of six characters, you can keep little miniatures in there, and you can keep your, your tokens separated in here. And as for the tokens, you've got... This is gimmicky, I admit it, but as a D&D &D geek, i got a real problem, as I told you. You've got these little tokens that, that mark status effects, and they fit on the, on the battle map. And it's got markers that show who's marked. You know, fighters do marking. Uh, various status effects like that. Uh, markers to show who's bloodied. Uh, markers to show... I don't know why there's a dead body marker. Hmm. Apparently you can write on them, write on them with wet erase markers. Yeah, there's like ongoing damage. stuff. There, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in this game where people have ongoing damage. They have poison effects. They have markings on them. And it's actually really hard to keep track of that at, at some point because when you've got six characters fighting six monsters, all of them throwing different status effects around, it's kind of hard to keep track of. And so I think these markers are actually going to do a lot 
to help keep track. And so as a DM, it's hard to keep track of, you know, the fighter goes, well, he's marked, and if he moves away from me, well, that's going to be a problem. He'll take five damage ongoing until he saves. This guy's on fire. He's going to take four damage ongoing until he saves. He's also blinded. It really is a nightmare. What I really liked about this one, though, is the lid of the box is lined with felt. So it's a little rolling surface. You can you can have your you roll your dice in there, and it you know keeps them neatly organized, and it's it's kind of uh, segregated from the rest of the table. You can have your own rolling space. You can consecrate this as your own little rolling space. Boo -boo -boo -boo. I like it, and like I said, you know you can kind of keep this as your little kit. You know you can have your stuff in here, and it's is it worth what did I pay for it? Twenty five dollars, I think it was. <laughs> I don't know. It's a DM tool. That's all it is. You know, when the DM starts whipping those things out. Could the DM easily make those himself? Yeah. But I, the, the little felt surface sold me. I don't know. I was, I, I was like, I kind of squeed with that one. I was all, felt, yay. The little rolling surface. Stuff like that. Okay. So, the other thing. I was really excited about this one. Monster Vault. Which really is just the monster manual for essentials and i'm a little curious and i'm not going to read this book in front of the camera for a while just because it would take forever but just thought we'd see what's inside i really like um one of the things i was always really disappointed by with fourth edition was i like the monster manual but there's not enough monsters because when you're running a game you really do have to choose monsters that are a balanced level to the party and that's a problem because in a book that small the space is limited of course so um if you want a first level encounter you've got a list of like 30 monsters from which to choose which is not a lot it's it it really restricts you um so when, when you're kind of this may sound a little silly but when you're designing your adventure, you kind of have to design them around the 30 monsters in the monster manual. So, uh, it 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 can get repetitive, you know, in a hurry. Um, it's it it restricts you. That's all I'm saying. And so, it, 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 believe me, you always want to have more choice than less. And so, there was there was not a lot of choice available in the in the other monster manuals. And what got to be a real problem was. Um, You've got three different monster manual books, each one with a different index, and so if you're looking through monsters, you have to look through three different books. Eh. Uh, that's why I actually like the the D and D Insider uh, Vault, the uh, the uh, not the Vault, the uh, what do they call it? Adventure Tools. You can search for first level monsters and it, it lists them all off, and I like that a lot because just just because you 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 want to have a balanced encounter set, and actually the balance is another one of those things. Here, here's where I complain again about something I really liked. Here's the thing that I got killed in Jason's campaign because of this. In AD&D, when there's a monster, that monster is a certain difficulty level. In 4th edition, it's like it's almost like World of Warcraft where when you're walking around and you see a wolf, that wolf could be first level or if you're in the later zones, that could be a dire hell wolf that has the same picture, but it's a level 35. And if your first level character tried to take it, it'll fucking kill him. You know, you have that little handy text over the, the you know, the, if the text is red, you don't fuck with it. Uh, in fourth edition, my first level character ran into a pack of goblins. And thinking, oh, well, there's six of us and there's six goblins. This is a fair fight. In fact, I kind of pitied the fools because... Goblins suck. Goblins are weak. Goblins have like, you know, in AD&D they have like four hit points. They're nothing. So we fought the goblins and I got killed because these goblins were goblin berserkers or something like that and they were essentially fourth level characters who hit harder in a normal hit than I had hit points. So they, they were rolling like D10 plus 6 for damage. These fucking goblins were obscene. So... They they did they, they kind of do this thing in, in fourth uh, fourth edition where you've got these monsters but the monsters have like scaled difficulty so there's there's goblins for beginners there's goblins for fifth level around about and then there's like paragon tier goblins who are 
it's kind of hard to predict what level or, or what is takeable in 4th edition because it's dependent on level and even among certain character cl- uh, c- certain monster types they are subclassified to lesser and greater extents and it's hard to tell at face value what you can take it's really weird so yeah we ran into 4th level fucking goblins and Jason still refuses to apologize to this day I feel, I feel misled I, I just I didn't know that goblins came in fourth level ass kicking variety. I would not have called that because in AD and D there's one type of goblin and that goblin sucks. You fight goblins at first level. It was just obvious, you know. It was, it, I, I didn't know there were fucking berserker fucking Conan goblins. Anyway, what's in the book? There is an adventure called Cairn of the Winter King, a role playing game adventure for fourth level characters. I won't complain about new adventures. I don't know why it's in the monster manual. It's got map. And, oh wow. Wowie wow. We've got all sorts of monster tokens. In fact, this is probably the entire box is monster tokens. Yeah. Although it does have some interesting features. I'll explain how. You've got monsters on this side, and you've got Probably what this signifies is bloodied when monsters are at half their hit points, which characters always know. And when there's multiple types of monsters, I don't know if you can see that they are numbered. So it's easy to refer to them by number. That's kind of cool. Unfortunately... Oh, by the way, on Gamma World, I didn't see the page numbers, but the page numbers are there. I was just looking in the wrong spot. I'm noob, apparently. It's the first book I've ever read. What do you want? Although, I'm not sure this is a real complaint, but there's no names on the monsters. Now, some of them need no introduction, but some of these, I don't know what the fuck they are. I guess you're just supposed to pick out monsters by just look. You know, if there's a if there's a hairy dude, you know, pick out a hairy dude. I guess you can just say that, but it would maybe help to have monster names. Even for stuff that's readily identifiable, like the carrion, like sorry, the, the carrion crawler, right there. I don't know. Part of me says that having names on the on the tokens would just kind of be disruptive and really break up the art flow. On the other hand, I don't know what some of this shit is. <laughs> There's a giant ochre jelly. <laughs> I even know what an ochre jelly is. Place a large creature. Oh, these are purple worm, frost giant, white dragon, umbra hulk. Wow, I can actually recognize these on site. Yeah, you've got all these different sheets with cardboard tokens on them, which is cool. I like having miniatures. I'm kind of old school that way, where I, I used to have all these little pewter miniatures. A lot, a lot harder to carry around and hard to store. Um, it's always been a problem for having a lot of miniatures and, and even tokens. I guess tokens are easier to store, but how do you store them? You know, like, um, sure, you throw them on a little bin, but what do you do when you want to find one? You know, let's say I want to find um, a Mephit. You know, like, I want to find this one. There's one of them. Where do I look? Like, I, I, I throw them on a Tupperware bin, and I just start digging through till I find I'm never going to find it in time. The game is going to stop. So, maybe i got to find them before the adventure starts. Still take a while to dig through all these hundreds and hundreds of tokens. Hmm. I don't know. That's If you guys have an organized, organized system, or, like, I, I guess I, I've seriously known some people who have, like, huge tackle boxes and they have little bins sorted by you know by name of course which is why i was i was initially thinking like oh well if we if we had like bins by name i knew a guy who had little plastic bins and he would say like okay this is a bin of insectoid creatures or and this is a bin of uh female adventures and this is a this is dwarves and you know they he basically had this little ad hoc system of classifications where he had various genus of monsters laid out and he had endless 
bins of monsters that would that would lay out. So if you wanted to find something, you'd go, oh, this is winged humanoids, and you'd take the bin and you'd start leaning. It, it worked. It was a little slower, but it was it was a system, I guess. I'm just not sure how you how you go through these and get out what you wanted quickly. It'd be tough. Let me know if you guys have a system because I'm actually kind of curious. I'd like to keep these organized because I'm kind of anal that way. Yeah, um, so the only thing left in the book is the book itself. Or, in the box is the book itself. Interesting. Wow. Hang on. Huh. I'm actually not sure if there's even much of a difference. Oh, I see. There's, there's something here. Yeah, just let's see if I can focus. It'll say, like, okay, Kobold Tunneler, and that's what it looks like. That's not in the fourth edition book, um, the uh, the original Monster Man. So, I guess, if you look through here, each one has its picture. At least that's that's kind of a guide. Yeah, that'll help. Let's see. Here, let me, let me see if I can find the goblin for you. I want to show you this. Fucking piss me off. Goblin. Okay. No. You've got your basic goblin, which is like a level one skirmisher or a level one minion artillery, which is fine. You got a, like a hobgoblin leader, who's who's kind of obviously a leader because he's like a level three, uh, level three. What is he? Controller, but it says leader, and he's kind of he's a, he's a little. Uh, if if Jason said, oh well, well he's got this uh, this skull headdress on and he's shave, he, he's like shaking a stick at you I'd be like oh okay he's a he's a leader he's not to be taken lightly but then you've got hobgoblin spear soldier this is what we faced <laughs> no 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 it wasn't we got oh these are different these are different but you've got what the fuck they did knock these down because the what I'm looking at is hobgoblins which which are very different from normal goblins we didn't face hobgoblins. We faced normal goblins. All right. Okay, so that is a little different. But yeah, the goblins we faced in 4th edition were 4th level. Fuck you. God damn. That was lame. Hated that shit. All right. Um, what else was I saying about the monsters? The adventure looks interesting. It actually looks like... I always like adventures that take you to... Uh, that are That are kind of specialized... So this one looks like it takes you up a snowy mountain, because, you know, Winter King and stuff like that. I always like adventures that give you excuses to go to weird and interesting places. Um, that gets you on a ship, for instance. Any adventure that lets you get on a boat and experience all those weird nautical creatures you never get to use otherwise. By the way, whenever you're playing a D&D game, anytime the DM is trying to get you on a ship, or even, like, raft down the river, he is trying to fuck you in the ass. Because this is... Always what happens. DM's looking through his fucking book. And he's like, Lizard men. I never get to use lizard men. Why? Because they live in the river. They never get out. They never try to cross a river. Every time there's a river trip, there's going to be lizard men. Just fucking count on it. It's going to happen. And so you don't even want to know what fucking happens when you get on like a ship across the sea. If you guys are ever trying to cross the sea, you might as well just pack it in because the, there's going to be a fucking kraken because like I guarantee you he looked in the monster man he's like a kraken that's awesome <laughs> he's you, you're gonna get a crack you're gonna release the kraken on you it's gonna be bad every time that I, I, I guarantee you boats are fucking death sentence in D&D &D. I know because I used to be that guy who was like you know they're going down the river and I'm like you hear a scrabbling underneath the raft and then lizard men jump up that's always the way it is so yeah monster vaults these are all DM tools, by the way. I think everything I've shown you so far is like a DM tool. The, the DM token set, the Monster Vault. You're never going to need this if you're a player. The last thing I got... Well, no, no, not the last thing. I got more stuff. Um, I don't even know if I should open this, really. Um, Dungeon Master Tile Set. I actually was kind of skeptical about the, the uh, dungeon tiles. But after using them in a local game, I really like them. Because it helps to have that kind of, uh, it helps to have that color and presence in a game. 
to where like okay you're in a castle or you're in a tavern and then the guy throws down you know he throws down a tavern it looks like a tavern it's got tables and it's got doors and it's got something it, it, it I, I hate to say it doesn't tax your imagination too much but it doesn't you know it um it, it works it works out well to help you visualize what he's going for and what counts as an obstacle and what doesn't it helps you it, it really does help the the situation in the game so like if you're in a tavern and if I were just to draw like a like a rectangular room with doors and windows and stuff like that I might forget something I might not have time or I might I might just leave out certain things like a tables or a bar or a little sinkhole like a place where the floor has fallen out and so that stuff has when you throw down like a, a dungeon tile, those things exist. You know, there's there's tables on the map. And it's easier to think about, even as a DM, what goes where in that room. It helps you visualize. Like, okay, here, for instance, like here. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but this actually looks like a tavern area where you've got the stairs and you've got the common area and you've got a bar here, you know, that kind of divides the room. It, it, if, if you're not familiar with that kind of architecture, just how that general room would look, it gives you some inspiration. And it really does, really for the D, I think it's more for the DM than, than anything, helps you see what this place would look like and kind of in your mind's eye, see what would go where and where a guy would hide if a guy was hiding back here. Like, maybe he's hiding behind the stairs here. You know, you could have a guy back here come out and surprise them. I really think for, for DMs it helps. Because it helps just little things, you know, like, you know, the, the, the walkway or where the windows are. I, I just think having... Because I, I guess maybe my problem is I'm really terrible at art. But when, when you've got something like this to help visualize, you can, you can build these places in a modular fashion as well. So, you, you know, you've got simple things like, you know carts and, and cows and stuff like that, a forge, you got tables, chairs, stuff that represents difficult terrain, you can throw those down, um, you know, fences, broken doors, I really like it. Again, as I said with the monsters, the real problem with the monster tiles is how to keep them organized, which is a challenge. Um, the guy I knew just had basically a, a gigantic Tupperware bin and you just sifted through, and it didn't actually take that long, but... These do take kept. This is actually a pretty good. It, it has a box, you know. But the thing is, it actually, it's almost like three D terrain. These are like rooftops. <laughs> you could probably cannibalize this box for terrain as well. It's divided up into little squares. That's kind of cool. I think the box is rather handy. Let me open this up again. That's all that's in there, though. It's just the. The sheets of tiles. I guess I could open this up. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> Let me see. Let's see if there's anything that catches my eye here. <sighs> I don't want to punch them out yet because they're cool. Okay, you got statues. You got bridges. That's kind of cool. Hang on. Got to be careful. These punch really easily, actually. Ah, the sewer level. You've got like a canal with a bridge going across it. It's kind of neat. And they're they're double sided, by the way. So there's there's shit on either side, which actually makes it really hard to find anything. <laughs> ah, the sewer outlet with lots of nice green sewage. I started collecting a bunch of dungeon tile sets because I, I also like the outdoors ones. The outdoors ones are, are even more useful because, again, I'm bad at drawing. There's a house, and it's kind of a modular house. You can you can break it up and, and build bigger houses with it. It works out really well. But I like the outdoors ones because um, the outdoors ones have terrain on them. It has trees. It has shrubs. It has uh, changes in elevation. It has... Uh, difficult terrain you know it, it, it's actually one of those things that adds a lot of character to an encounter when there's just not not hindering terrain you know it makes the encounter like unfair but just have that character of the area they're in so like if they're if they're camped up against a canyon wall or if they're if they're up on a hill to make camp or something like that then you have that situation and you have the various terrain it help, it really does help them kind of organize a defense helps them get into the mood. So if, otherwise, I'm just like, I just roll out a mat and I draw like a couple half-assed trees, because again, I suck. But for me, it helps. And so as, as a DM tool, 
if you're really struggling to come up with interesting encounters, I really think these DM tiles are, are a great fit. They're not cheap. Well, they're cheaper than building your own terrain, but um, I'm actually not sure how much they cost now. This was a little pricey. I think this was probably 30 bucks. Let me, let me see. Yeah, 30 bucks. At the sewer, but this is actually a pretty comprehensive set of tiles. I mean, you've got outdoors, you've got town, you got village, you've got a gazebo, <laughs> the deadly gazebo, you've got town market fruit carts, cool stuff that way. You've got great floors. This is the open area stuff. A lot of sewer stuff for your for your dungeon needs. A weakness of the dungeon tile system. These don't actually snap together. They used to be kind of interlocking like puzzle pieces. And I don't know, maybe they got tired of that. Maybe they found it too limiting. But these just kind of push together. They don't have any kind of interlocking pieces. That's actually something that might, if, if, you're, if you're a big aficionado of these type of things, if they don't lock together, that might be a problem because you like your map to stay together. And actually, what I, what I was saying a minute ago was that one of the problems of dungeon tiles is um, when the session's over, you have to put them away. More than likely, you have to put them away. And with a rollout map, you can actually keep them on the map. Uh, with, with, like, a final map. I, I used to do that. I used to have, like, maps that would persist for, like, two to three weeks. Which, actually, you shouldn't do, because when you leave wet erase markers on a vinyl map, odds are they kind of soak in and they stain. And they have done. But that was, it was, it was kind of cool whipping out the same map for, for a persistent encounter. Um... On the other hand, a strength of these is if you drew a map of a location before, I've done this before actually, where they had to fight in a throne room. And they had a huge climactic fight in this throne room, uh, you know, months ago. And so they had another huge climactic fight later on in that same throne room. And I didn't exactly remember how the throne room went. So if you actually compare the two maps I drew, if you could even find them, I doubt you could. But if, if you remember the last map, you'd be like, that throne room is nothing like the last throne room. And so I think it was almost identical, but probably not close. There was probably doors in different places. and so. But in this one, you could probably build the exact same throne room that way. I do have a special surprise. So that's all the D&D stuff I have. But here's where I start to really embarrass myself and start talking about where I've really got a addiction problem. So hang on a second. I've got to go over there and, and get some stuff. Hang on. Dungeon, ma Dungeon Master set the city. I got some other stuff and you're going to laugh at me, but it's okay. Let's see. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> I got all sorts of stuff. This, you don't even want to know. I got a Song of Ice and Fire campaign guide. Now, I haven't read all of this yet, and actually I don't think I will ever read all of this. What this is, is it's a companion book to the Song of Ice and Fire RPG. Again, a game I will probably never ever play, but if I do, I'm going to be fucking ready. Um, I love the Song of Ice and Fire novels. What this is, is basically every single character in the, in the, in the entire series statted. So if you want Robert Baratheon... There's stats for Robert Baratheon. If you want stats for Sandor Clegane, if you want the Hound in your book, I may have actually flipped right. No, I got Euron Greyjoy, Lord Balon Greyjoy. It's it's basically it's the campaign setting. That's what it is. So it it kind of goes through every single region of Westeros. It's got maps. I'll show you on. Oh, oh, I'll show you. That. Uh, you know, you've got maps of Westeros, which are actually really well done. The artwork in this is gorgeous. I love the artwork in this book. It's so great. There's actually a calendar of the Song of Ice and Fire artwork, which is very similar to this. I actually kind of want it. Uh, you've got stats for Lord Stannis Baratheon and Melisandre. Melisandre's a bad woman. She's a very bad woman. She does bad things. And Stannis loves it. But she's bad. It's got... It, honestly, the, the amount of detail in this book is staggering. Because, like I guess every single character, if you want Viserys Targaryen, he's in the book. It's got... It's got history and stats for every one of the noble houses. Like, every one of these. 
is a noble house. Which I'm guessing were even mentioned in passing in the novel. Like, some guy's like, oh, this guy's from House Chelston. And this is the standard. It's got a it's got a bend green and white crossed mace and silver dagger as its standard on the shield. I'm guessing that was like a one sentence description as one guy was walking past a pavilion at the jousting tournament. It's like, oh, we met a knight from House Chelston. And the guy's like, okay, we'll fucking put that in there, you know. You got all these houses. What other houses they've sworn allegiance to. It's got maps. I mentioned that. Uh, it's got it's got simple things of what taking the black means. It's got a history of Westeros. Huge spoilers for the novels. You would never want to read this if you haven't read the novels. Yeah, this is this is a pretty awesome book. And like I said, you'll pretty much never read all of this because what's the point? Like again, you know, you really only open this like if they go to if they go to King's Landing, you're going to open up the chapter to King's Landing. You've got a map of King's Landing. If they go to Dragonstone, you open up the book to Dragonstone. There's the map. There's everyone in it. That's it. I think the real appeal of A Song of Ice and Fire is not only are you adventuring in the in the Game of Thrones world, which is awesome, but there's always the chance you're going to accidentally kill a major plot character. <laughs> I think that's really why people play it. Like, it doesn't take place during the War of the Usurper, like the during the during the uh, course of the novels. It takes place. I think just after Robert gains the throne, which is not spoilers, don't worry about that. Um, it takes place in that period just between the novels and when Robert takes the throne. And I really think the reason you play the game is so there's always the chance that someone accidentally gets a lance through the eye. So there's that. I think there's an adventure called Peril at King's Landing, which I think starts off with a joust to celebrate Robert's ascension to the throne. And so, I don't know. Maybe, like, I, I just know that somebody's going to be like, I'm going to enter the jousting tournament because I hear Jamie Lannister's going to be there. So you're probably not going to beat him, but there's always that chance for the random crit. You're going to cave Jamie's fucking head in. Then the novels are in deep shit. <laughs> so the DM's got to think on his feet. And all of a sudden, you've got a world without Jamie Lannister. And yeah, it's always a problem. I don't know. It sounds like fun to me. I would love to play this, but the problem... The real crippling flaw to this game is everyone involved has to be a fan of the books. I don't see any other way around it. I don't think there is. Like, if there's one person who doesn't know anything about these novels, they're going to be lost. It, like I said, it even takes place outside of novel continuity, so it's not like you need to have an intimate knowledge of the characters or how they interact. Like, you could be some clueless dude, I guess. But even so, there's so much history with the Targaryens and, you know, what the Targaryens did, their 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 ancestry of madness and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the the really unique way they handle the old gods and the new, the the type of religion, the Septons and stuff like that. It's they he really does establish over the course of the novels this really unique you know, culture. And it's if you're not if you're not familiar with the culture, you're gonna be so left in the dust. I really think you have to be a fan of the novel. And so getting together a group of like five, six fans of the novels, I tried. I did. It didn't happen. Now, I don't exactly live in an area that's conducive to playing RPGs, obviously. But yeah, this is this is a hard sell. I don't know. So, oh yeah. This one was just for me. Uh, this is Bloodstained Stars, which is a book I couldn't find online at all. What this really is, it's basically campaign fluff for uh, a special campaign for The Burning Wheel, one of the games with the worst covers I've ever seen in my life. Great game, shitty cover. I have, again, Burning Wheel is one of those games where I will probably never ever likely play. But I can appreciate it for its artistry. This is, uh, Bloodstained Stars is a sci-fi setting for Burning Wheel called uh, Iron Empires, I believe. I think they call it Burning Stars or something like that in the, uh, in the setting. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one. I, 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 I'm actually kind of curious about this one. I picked this up on Impulse. Um, it's a sci-fi RPG called Eclipse Phase. And it actually doesn't say anything on the back. I was a little disturbed by the lack of a blurb on the back. Just trying to explain what this is. It says, The role-playing game of transhuman conspiracy and horror. And you can see on the cover there's a guy getting blown out of a spaceship and some Cthuloid monster spearing him through the chest. So, like, okay, I'm sold. It 
says, your mind is software, your body is a shell. Death is a, di death is a disease, extinction is approaching. So, I pr it, the artwork is great. Really. Um, I like it. But I have, I have not even... I just kind of flipped through it, and I thought, okay, this is kind of interesting. It's sci-fi horror. It looks, it looks to me kind of like if Dead Space were an RPG, uh, and I, I kind of dug that. It just, it just from the general look of it, it looks a little different than that, of course. Um, they, they have this big thing called uh, transhumanism, where let me see. It's an intellectual and cultural movement that endorses the use of science and technology to enhance the human condition physically and mentally. Yeah. So it's like, it almost looks like Cthulhu punk. You know, it's that, that mix of cyberpunk and Call of Cthulhu, which I kind of dig. So I'm kind of curious about this one. I'm, I'm probably going to read through it in my spare time and just kind of check it out. Looks well made. Artwork looks fine. Yeah. Looks fine to me. And now, again, this is again where I, this is where I call myself a real book whore because if I'm ever likely to do this kind of game, I probably wouldn't open this book up. I would probably just get people together to play GURPS and play like Traveler or even the Cthulhu Punk version of GURPS. I don't know. Again, this is where I'm such a book whore. You should, you should actually see the shelves of books I have that you haven't even seen yet with all the RPG books on them. Now, the crown jewel. My friend Rob sold this to me because I didn't even know this existed. But I'm gonna show it to you anyway. <laughs> You're not ready for this. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> it's Know Your Role, the World Wrestling Entertainment role playing game. I guess you could call it a Know Your Role playing game. So, yeah, this is a book called from uh, Comic Images. It says, Boos rain down on your opponent. The capacity crowd makes it known that they don't appreciate his heel antics. Neither to you, neither do you. And you like his steel chair shot across your skull last week even less. It's not just about payback when you step inside the ring, but a chance to cement your legacy on the biggest stage of them all. World Wrestling Entertainment. This is an OGL-based role-playing game that thrusts you into the body-slamming, pile-driving, high-octane world of sports entertainment. Take on the role of your favorite WWE superstar or create your own and commence kicking butt on your quest for championship glory. All you need are a handful of dice, a character sheet, and a few friends who dare to test your ring prowess. Oh, and you'd better bring some attitude. The attitude era is over. <laughs> okay. Now again, I haven't read this. I've only flipped through it. But I'm curious. Let me see. Let me see if there's pre-made characters. I don't actually don't think there are. No, there are. Okay, who can I play as? Chapter 8. The most electrifying roster in sports entertainment. Okay, I can play as The Rock. I can play as Triple H. Triple H looking really young in this book, too. Chris Jericho. Edge. Natch. You think you know him as the one of the brightest young superstars of the WWE. Toronto's favorite son vowed to become a superstar. Rhino? <laughs> Tajiri. We're kind of skipping ahead al alphabetically. Ooh. It could be Trish Stratus. What is that? The Hurricane? <laughs> I, could be the, I could be the Hurricane. Oh my god. Or. Oh. There's. If, if you've ever wondered what the stats for Jonathan Coachman are, worry no more. You've also got. Earl Hebner and Eric Bischoff and The Undertaker. Ooh, is this Biker Taker? Might be. Kurt Angle? Hang on. Eric Bischoff, the unscrupulous general manager of Raw, enjoys his position of power. He regularly shocks his fans by making selfish yet entertaining decisions regarding what happens on his show. What's his bullshit rating? Uh, bluff plus 14. This is D20 system, you gotta remember. Because if you're going to play a WWE RPG, D20 system's the way to go. Oh. Eddie Guerrero. 
Although Eddie's fight with addiction is well documented to SmackDown fans, it hasn't dampened his amazing rapport with the fans or his ability to arouse them. With his trademarked lowrider, he's found a new addiction, a drive to win, and he's willing to cheat, lie, and steal for any title. Awkward. What's his constitution? Because I think it's too high. Constitution's 13. That's about right. Bubba Ray Dudley. <laughs> Tori Wilson. Tori. What's her charisma? 18? My mind just blew. Tori Wilson's charisma is 18. <laughs> Bordering on superhuman, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to see what Trish Stratus's charisma was. Excuse me, okay. Let's see. Trish Stratus, 18. Tori Wilson is every bit as charismatic as Trish Stratus. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh my god. Theodore Long. His charisma is only 14. And Paul E. Paul e. Heyman, 14. Okay, okay. <laughs> See if you can guess what her signature move is. No, her finishing maneuver is the neck breaker. Okay. Wow. I have nothing to contribute to that, except that Tori Wilson has an 18 charisma. Sadly, they don't have Al Wilson statted in there, but I'm guessing his charisma could be even higher. Okay, on, I, I should just I should just end the review there. Tori Wilson. <laughs> I was looking through the feats. Really, this is a. I, 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 just, I have no idea how the combat works, but it's D20. Wow, look at, look at Paul Lee and Rob Van Dam there. Really early photos. By the way, this is a great cover, by the way. Two ugly fucking dudes grimacing in pain where it looks like one guy's about to butt sex the other. Yeah, that's good. And I really think they missed out an opportunity to pun the word roll. Roll. I don't know. Let's see. Interfere. Oh, oh, there's classes. Hang on. Oh, I, I, hang on, I gotta see this. Multi-class characters. What the fuck? Oh, hang on. This, this is gonna be good. Hang on. I, I'm sorry. I'm taking some base attack bonus. Character classes. Mm-hmm. Class section, page 19. There we go. Okay. First class, Aerial Superstar. Look at that elevation, Taz. He launched himself straight into the stratosphere. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to be the poor guy underneath him when he comes down. We got guys like Chavo Guerrero, Christian Edge, Matt Hardy, Molly Holly, <laughs> Scotty Too Hotty, and Victoria, an Aerial Superstar. Power superstar, rough superstar, like Danny Basham, Doug Basham, <laughs> Mick Foley, Hardcore Holly, Rosie, and Tyson Tomko. This book is awesome. Savvy superstar, like John Cena, John Cena, and Ric Flair, Eddie Guerrero, Randy Orton, Stevie Richards. Trish Stratus, this is all over the map. This must have been when John Cena was still heel. Had to be. Technical superstar, like Kurt Angle, Shelton Benjamin, Chris Benoit, <laughs> Rob Conway, Rene Dupree, Eugene, <laughs> Sylvain Grenier, Charlie Haas, Orlando Jordan, William Regal, Kenzo Suzuki and Val Venus. <laughs> K 
Kenzo Suzuki? I remember that guy. He sucked. Oh my god, he sucked so bad. <laughs> and he's Val Venus <laughs> and Rob Conway. <sighs> and of course, managers. Wow. Oh, Lita. There's a picture of Lita here. You can't see it. I'm saving that one for me. And uh, you have to start off on Velocity. <laughs> WWE Velocity. Okay, now, I remember there were some good feats here. Okay, feats. I'm just going to read the read the names and get you interested, and then I'm going to close the book up. Okay. Aerial Maneuvers Proficiency. Bat Out of Hell. Okay, Bat Out of Hell. You gain a plus two bonus to dexterity rolls in a chase and reflex saves versus count out. <laughs> Can of Whoop-Ass. After taking a beating, you can whip yourself into a frenzy and tear into your opponent like a berserk madman. <laughs> Cheap shot artist. Extra finisher. You have developed an extra finishing maneuver. It's like Sting. Sting took that feat five times. Giant killer. Gut check. Heat machine. Imposing. What's the one where you no-sell everything? Ah, impervious. You have a preternatural aura of invincibility. You can remain unhurt from an attack, shaking off damage completely. John Cena and The Undertaker have taken that feat seven times. You can reduce damage from one attack to zero with a successful fortitude check. DC equals damage dealt. You can use this feat a number of times per match or segment equal to your constitution modifier. Yeah, he has that. Lightning reflexes, low center of gravity. Moonlighting. You are hardworking and have de developed a nice career or two outside of sports entertainment. Quicker than a hiccup. Smelled a fish. Testicular fortitude. Prerequisite. Great fortitude. You have the guts to fight off blows that would knock an average superstar for a loop. <laughs> wow. And we have a classic picture of the hurricane choke slamming Ric Flair. A moment that really should have been immortalized in my memory, but somehow let that one slip. Jonathan Coachman got his own picture. That's neat. <laughs> There's a picture of good old JR and the king. The king looks happy to be here. Jim Ross is not amused with your bullshit. <laughs> he's, he looks so... Take your fucking picture, buddy. Oh, my God, I hate this. I hate this fucking game. <laughs> Jim Ross. Oh, Jim. Uh, we're almost done here. You, get, you actually have to buy your maneuvers. You can only have a certain number of maneuvers. John Cena wrestling Orlando Jordan. Tajiri. What happened to you, Tajiri? Is it Rhino Goring Rene Dupree? I can't believe I remember Rene Dupree. <laughs> Eric Bischoff. A lot less hair back then, but looks the same as ever. Who the fuck is that? Who is that? Who is this? I have no clue who that is. Oh, God. I can't even begin to tell me. This was after the brand split, apparently. It's got the two different titles for each brand. Before the spinner belt, however. Cruiserweight Championship. Women's Championship. <laughs> T 
Taz and Michael Cole in Happier Times. Yeah. All right. Well, it may actually surprise you to know that there was a WWF RPG before this. And I think I own it. I, we're talking WWF and the Hulk Hogan Ultimate Warrior, like 1984. I think I have that book. I'm going to go look to see if I have that, but not right now. Um, yeah, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed my, my odyssey through very strange role-playing game and a brief peek into my own perpetual madness and um, inability to control my instincts when it comes to blind buying games I have no knowledge about and will probably never ever play. But, you know, I guess there's worse, more damaging habits to have. So, until next time, everybody, you guys have fun and uh, keep gaming.